So where, where things left off, where I left off, talking about household magnets, I, I sort of introduced the, the idea of magnetic poles, the, the, the fact that, that magnetic poles don't, don't come in isolation. They always come in equal and opposite pairs, so that everything we ever encounter is, has a net pole of zero. Uh, the simplest example thereof being, being bar magnets, these, these simple objects that have a nor one north pole, one south pole, so they have some magnetic character to them, but the net pole zero. So any questions about this, this stuff still? Going back. Uh, I, I then talked about the, sort of the origins of the magnetism that we see in objects and materials uh, being primarily due to their electrons. And the fact, so the fact that electrons are intrinsically magnetic. They don't have a net pole, but they have a net dipole. They have a dipole. So they have a north pole and a south pole, and it's associated with the, 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 the fact that they, that they also have angular momentum. And th that, at the moment, doesn't matter very much. It's just, if you, if you just recognize that the electrons have a north pole and a south pole, and they can orient that, that pole. They, they have some choice in that. And if you bring electrons together in, in, to, to assemble atoms or to assemble molecules or even finally materials, there is a lot of tendency for the electron magnetic dipoles to pair up in, in, in two electrons will, will pair together such that one of them is, has its magnetic north pole up and the other has its magnetic north pole down. And you can worry about, well, what about left and right or something like that. The details there are complicated because of quantum physics. But the main issue is that they go together in pairs with one north pole canceling the other one, the, the, pairing up with the other one's south pole. I mean, this, this is a, a, attractive to the two of them, in effect. And they end up with no overall magnetic dipole. They're, 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 they're magnetically nothing. And that, that dominates uh, atoms, molecules, materials. That, there's a lot of cancellation of the electron magnet, magnetism, such that most materials are non-magnetic. We're essentially non-magnetic. Um, people are, are looking for, for structures within us that, that have some response to magnetism. There are certainly some animals uh, that have magnetic pe aspects to them. For example, birds navigate to some extent by uh, using the Earth's magnetic, uh, magnetic field, which I'll come to field shortly. So, so birds do have some structures inside them that, that are magnetic sense magnetism. But we, as far as we know, I, I've never heard that people have any such, such effect. So this, there, there are various magnetic cure-alls cure around. Uh, you can get magnets to try to uh, help your sore elbow or your or knee or something like that, supposedly. From a physicist's point of view, it's not clear how a magnet would have any effect on us. Uh, we're, so we're so, our, our structures are so oblivious to magnetism that probably those cure-alls are sort of, are, you, know, you know, mostly placebo effect. All right. So if there are magnetic materials around, and there are, how do they work? And that was where I left off last time. And I pointed out that there are a few metals and other materials that do have uh, magnetic structure, but it, it's primarily down there at the atomic level, which mean, by, by which I mean that you've got you to zoom in close and really look at sort of uh, to the point where you're, where you're looking at patches of, of, of atoms that have some residual electron magnetism, first off, and that in the process of pairing up as a team of atoms, they don't kill off their magnetism. And one example of this is, is iron and all the iron mixtures, which, which are typically called steels. So iron and, and, and many steels are intrinsically magnetic. The, 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 the nature of the magnetism, it's, it's called ferromagnetism in this case. And, and the word ferro is associated with iron and iron's uh, uh, alloys and other, other chemicals. And ferromagnetism involves lots of atoms, each with its own little portion of magnetism, uh, all aligning up together. There are other arrangements that are interesting magnetically, too. There's, there are materials that are called anti-ferromagnetic, meaning that each atom is magnetic, but they, but they arrange themselves so that they cancel each other. 
Uh, chromium is an anti-ferromagnet. It, it, you, you wouldn't notice it's magnetic, but if you study it's, it's, it in great detail, you'll discover, oh, the atoms actually are still magnetic. It's just they, they cancel each other perfectly on an atom, ne atom in its neighbor's basis. But the details of, of, of all those complicated ferromagnetic, ferrimagnetic, anti-ferromagnetic, I mean, set those aside. The one that we care about is, is what's called the ferromagnetic materials, which are these ones that have a lot, a lot of atomic magnetism and it, 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 uh, there's a lot of, of agreement among adjacent atoms to point all the same way with their, with their magnets. And so the, the, going back to the sort of fun and games examples of, of this, just, uh, they are more illustrations of the effect than they are actually anything. They're not obviously atoms. But let's see if I do this. You now should be looking down on, a, on yet another collection of little, little magnetic dipoles. So this, these are arranged so they've got little magnets glued on, on plastic rods so that uh, each of these little guys has a north pole and a south pole exposed. And they tend to line up with each other. If I scramble them, they all will settle down into little patches uh, of agreement. So there's, a, there's agreement around here. These guys are agreeing. These guys have the, a, a different opinion of whatever. This, this situation where you get patches of atoms, so this, again, this is just an illustration rather than the, the real ferromagnetism. The situation where you've got these little patches of agreement and they, the, the patches as a group, uh, if you, collectively the patches don't agree, but the, each patch has local agreement. That structure, it's called a domain structure, and you have magnetic domains, and they, as a, as a big group, have trouble all, all agreeing on the same direction, because when they do do that, they, uh, they end up with a lot of stored energy, because then they, if, if they all agree to put their North Pole toward you and their South Pole toward me, we now have a North Pole over here and a South Pole over here. There, there's a sort of a net accumulation of North Pole there, South Pole there. These two poles would love to get together, and how do they do that? They do that by undoing the, all, the big, beautiful alignment. There's, it takes energy to pull these two poles apart, and that energy is stored in the alignment and it can be released by ruining the alignment. And so the domains tend to sort of break up into disagreements. I mean, I could probably do some, some societal uh, analogy to this. It breaks up into little tribes. But, it, but OK, so you end up with these patches. Uh, this guy shows those patches. This guy, this is actually my favorite, this one. I'll go back to this, this little guy with all the, all the little uh, arrows. Now we got this tremendous light. Well, anyway, you can see that, it, that it's, got, it's got patches along here. There's a patch there, there's a patch there, there's another patch there, and so on. Those are all, in effect, the domains uh, in disagreement. And when you first make this, this a material like this, like a piece of iron or steel, you, and you just, you, you start it off with, with molten iron, steel, you put it together, it naturally ends up, I, can I turn off the lamp? There. It ends up with those patches in it, and the patches are all pointing in different directions, and on a grand scheme of things, if you zoom back and look at the overall piece of steel, it has no, no, there's no evidence of magnetic character. And so that's your refrigerator when it was first manufactured. Nobody paid any attention to magnetism, they just made it out of uh, at some point, it might well have been molten, uh, molten steel, rolled into sheets and assembled in your refrigerator a lot. The magnetism is there at the atomic and near atomic scale in those domains, but they're all scrambled and, and there's no obvious uh, magnetism. And the showroom full of refrigerators doesn't have, they're not leaping at each other because of magnetic attractions or repulsions. But if you bring a refrigerator magnet up to these, so if you bring something that's intrinsically magnetic up to those, to, to, that, to that patchwork of domains, the domains change shape. So I'm going to bring a magnet up, and when I do that, I pull all of them into alignment. And in this case, they stay aligned even when I take the magnet away. So what I've done is I have magnetized, well, this illustration 
of, of how a domain works. But this is what happens when you bring a magnet up to your refrigerator. As the magnet, say a north pole of the magnet, gets close to the refrigerator surface, the steel refrigerator surface, the domains that live inside that steel begin to, to evolve in size and shape. They, the ones that are aligned so that they point their north pole towards my, uh, their south pole toward my approaching north pole, they're happy. They, they're, they're attracted that way and they, and they like that. All the other ones wish they could do better and they begin to evolve such that they also are pointing their south poles towards my approaching north pole. And the, 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 technically there, there are issues like the domains don't, don't actually rotate as, a, as, a, as a, a team of atoms and their atomic atoms. They, grow, they change in size. So, do, so, so one, one domain that's, a, that's aligned the right way grows. It, the wall between it, the edges of its domain that separate it from the other domains, those domain walls move. They head across and, and gobble up adjacent pro improperly oriented domains until finally it's one big, uh, all the domains are pointing the right way. And that process of having them all turn, um, they, the, the, the domain, domain walls movement, you can actually, there, there are ways you can observe it or even hear it. And I'm, I'm going to show it to you. And here's how it's going to work. So we just got a speaker system here. And it's, that's, going to, that's in effect listening to the behavior of this piece of iron or steel that's in there. And how we're listening involves electricity, and there's a relationship that we're going to come to very soon between electricity and magnetism. So the details of how it notices the domains moving aren't important at the moment. But when I bring the magnetic, this is a south pole. If I bring the south pole up to the, to the iron, all the domains will evolve to point their north pole toward it. If, if I bring the, the north pole of this magnet up, the domains will, will evolve to go the other way. And what you're going to hear is you'll hear, the, in effect, the individual domains changing. The walls moving through, the, these domain walls moving through. And they go statistically, and you'll hear, you hear a whoosh sound as the domains, one after the next, go, go re reverse. Once it's happened, it's pretty much happened. So I, I, have, to, I have to flip the magnet to get, to get the full effect. Can you hear it? So I mean, it seems like kind of a, kind of a swindle here, because you know, it's all too, too much technology involved. But you really are hearing that happen, that, that evolution. If I replace the steel with, do I have a piece of copper or aluminum? Not today. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, if, I put, if I put a non-magnetic metal, there's no sound. It, it, it needs to be a magnetic metal, and I need to, to keep flipping its domains around to make that happen. All right. The, it, 30 years ago, that would be, you know it was real. Nowadays, you can fake everything, right? I can, be, I, I can just be playing back sounds off of a cell phone. Uh, it's a little unfortunate, but... That, or that, that's real. It's, called, it's an effect called the Barkhausen effect, that you hear the, hear the domains flipping. OK, so having flipped the domains, the question is, do they stay flipped, or do they go back the way they were, all disagreeing? Do they break up into these patches of, of disagreement? And that depends on the material, and in particular, how, how hard it is for the domain walls to move, the boundaries between domains to move about. And in pure iron, those, those, those domain walls move very easily through the, through the iron crystal. And believe it or not, iron is a, is a crystalline metal like most metals are crystalline. You just don't see their facets very often. Um, anyway, the domain walls move easily, and so the, the, the material quickly forgets its, its magnetiz <coughs> magnetization. So this has, is remembering its magnetization. But if, but if we introduce thermal energy, and, and this, is, this, is, this is my equivalent of thermal energy here. Thermal energy is this random uh, ability for things to, to, to do thing, to little, little doses of energy that can cause upset. It breaks up again into domains that disagree. So now they're back to disagreeing. So I can magnetize it. 
and I can, this is, now I'm actively demagnetizing it by deliberately scrambling the, the domains. Pure iron demagnetizes very easily. It's, it spontaneously demagnetizes, in part because it's, when it's magnetized, it's got extra energy and hates this. The pole, those opposite poles want to get together by, by crushing the domains and get into, into randomness. And in part because thermal energy is around to scramble things. So uh, pure iron is known as a, a soft magnetic material. So soft magnetic materials are ones in which the domains change size and, sh and orientations very easily. And they're easy to magnetize. Takes no big effort. Uh, they respond easily to any approaching magnetic pole. But then, they, then they, they forget the magnetization when you, when you take the magnetic pole away. Um, situation, things that, that, that use soft magnetic materials are, as we'll see, electromagnets uh, typically use this, ones you want to be able to turn on and off, and it's part of the problem set that will be due like a million years from now after spring break. Um, they're, they're, the, the use of soft magnetic materials, they're good in magnets you want to be able to turn on and off, they're useful in transformers. Um, various other mag magnetic actuators, doorbells, the old-fashioned doorbells, again, those are going the way of the dodo bird, too. So that's soft magnetic materials. Hard magnetic materials are the opposite. These are materials that impede the, the evolution of domains. They have domains, and the domains, when, uh, when you fabricate the magnet, or, or, or the material, it, has, it, it doesn't have any magnetization. It's, it's still scrambled. It came out of uh, the molten soup, maybe. But once you magnetize it, which turns out to be difficult because to, to, to get the magnetization to happen, you really have to push the domain walls around, and they hate moving in, in a hard magnetic material. And then when you take away the magnetizing effect, the external thing that did the magnetizing, the domain walls certainly don't want to move, and the stuff stays magnetized. So that's a hard magnetic material, a material that's hard to magnetize and hard to demagnetize. And it can't be demagnetized by itself by virtue of its strong magnetic poles, uh, wanting to get back together, and by virtue of thermal energy. So I should say any material, mag hard or soft, you can ruin its magnetization, that is, mess up its domains, if you go in there and, and muck with them. And how do you do that? Hit it with a hammer. Hammers are not good for magnets. Not because you can break them, but because you, you, you pump in energy and shake them up. So, so pounding a magnet or, or letting a magnet hit things uh, will weaken its, its magnetization. It, it'll lose a little bit of its oomph. Um, thermal energy, a lot of magnets, you put them in the oven and you kill them. Uh, they have, they have a, a temperature above which they basically give up and forget. Um, those are the main ones. Um, if you expose them to external magnetic influences, you can upset them as well. Actually, I should show you that. Let me, let me stop looking at this guy and come back. My, my view graph. I'm, I'm realize I'm showing you this slide and then not showing you this slide. Where is it? PC main. Back up here. Um, if you remember, I think it was yesterday, maybe the last you know, two classes ago, I, I had this, this bar magnet and I brought it up to one of these bar mag magnets on a swivel, expecting its north pole to attract, the one labeled north pole to attract the south pole, and it misbehaved. Now it's behaving properly. But the other day, it was re the, the red pole was attracting the other red pole. I knew, how was that? And I, I set that magnet aside going, uh-oh, you know, this is messed up. It's because these bar magnets, when they were made, weren't magnetic. They were just a chunk of, of hard magnetic material. That means they're capable of being magnetized and, and remembering it, but you've got to magnetize them. You've got to teach them which, which end should be north, which should be south. And the fact that you, that you give it a magnetic dipole takes energy because you have to, it starts with no pole, dipole and you're essentially pulling a north and south pole apart to put a north pole on the red end and a south pole on the, on the white end. Uh, you're investing energy into the magnet. It's, it's actually there and it is released when you ruin its magnetization. But this was magnetized and we can magnetize it the wrong way if we like. So right now, it is magnetically correct. Its red end is north, and it attracts the white south poles. But let's mess with it now. This, this device over here is a magnetizer. And I 
think this, will, this should ruin it. It is an electromagnetic device that does the magnetization. Okay. If I, if I haven't wrecked it, I, 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 can, I can fix it. I've wrecked it, right? The red end is attracting the red end. Same over here. Oh, no. Right? So the north end and the south end of any little bar magnet, including the one on a compass, was a stab that they, they were created somewhere in a factory. Somebody, somebody initially magnetized that needle. Uh, in Jules Verne's Journey to the Center of the Earth, which who know, I don't know whether you guys read those sorts of books anymore, but, but they're, they're exploring deep underground. And, and some, some event reverses the, the magnetization of their compass. The north, the, the pole that's supposed to take them toward the north become, begins to take them toward the south. It's, it can happen. So now if I want to fix this guy, I put that one in and redo the magnetization. And now it's back to normal. So permanent magnets are deliberately magnetized at some point in their construction. Is that okay? And I should say permanent magnets, I, I use that word cavalierly, but, but what that means, a permanent magnet has two characteristics. First off, it is a hard magnetic material. It's made of something that can, that can be magnetized with difficulty, but then retains its magnetization against a lot of abuse. So these guys are made of a material. This is not pure iron. If it were pure iron, you couldn't magnetize it and have it remember for very long. It would forget. The paper clips I was playing with last, last class, they're very slightly hard magnetic material, meaning that you can magnetize them pretty easily, and they remember a little bit. For a little while, they remember their magnetization. But in the face of a little bit of thermal energy and a little bit of shaking around and stuff, they'll, they, they pretty much forget their magnetization. This is a fairly strong magnetic material. It's not as strong as the modern, the, 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 I call, I'll call them the super magnets, but the, the neodymium iron boron magnets that are now kind of dime a dozen around. I, you, you can find them all, you know, in, in random stores. I wouldn't tell, tell you exactly where to go. They're extremely strong magnets. They are tremendously hard magnetic materials. They are super difficult to magnetize. Uh, mostly it's got to be done professionally with, with big equipment. But once they are magnetized, they are very hard to unmagnetize. And they therefore can, t they can uh, end up with a very strong magnetic north pole at one end and a south pole at the other. Um, you can put more than one pole on them, but most, typically they have one pole, one north, one south, and they're really um, intense poles. That, the strength of those poles means there's a lot of energy stored in those magnets, and they're, they're often rated in terms of how much energy uh, it has been invested in them in, into magnetizing them. Um, they do tend to just self-destruct when you let them leap at each other because they hit, they sh they're brittle. They're brittle for, in part because the brittleness is associated with the difficulty of domains uh, changing, uh, domain walls moving. That brittleness is, is, is important to that. And when they break, they tend to flip over, which is how, how they release some of that stored magnetic energy. The, the, pieces, the pieces reorient so to, put, to bring north poles as close to south poles as possible and release some of that energy. So they're dangerous if you're, if you're careless. Uh, not only can they self-destruct, but they can, they can uh, release a lot of energy in the process. So that's hard and uh, soft magnetic materials. You OK with that idea? Um, what I should also show you, and what I would, where I would have gone many years ago, there were a lot of uh, situations in which information is stored by, ma by the magnetization of, of uh, structures. Uh, the, the classic example of this being magnetic tape. Uh, music was recorded first on, on wires by magnetizing wires with, magnetic, with wire recorders which you know, in, in my 
younger years, we would laugh at, oh, ha, ha, they, they actually recorded music on magnetic wires. Ha, ha, we use magnetic tapes. And now you'd, have a, you'd be hard-pressed to find magnetic tapes anymore. They're, they're pretty much gone. How those worked was they have lots of little structures on the surface of the tape, and you could magnetize those structures. They were, they, the, the details of their, their exact structures sort of messy, but, but, but you could expose them to a strong magnetic influence and magnetize them. And you could magnetize them one way or a different way and stuff. And that's how the, the music was recorded. On, on, first on reel-to-reel -reel tapes and then on cassette tapes. And now cassette tapes are gone the way of the dodo bird, too. You were just all chips, OK? Chips and uh, data coming over the internet. Uh, but you can still see that these sort of patterns of magnetization, they still show up on credit cards. Even That's going to die, too. But um, let me show you that you can see these patterns, the information written on a credit card. First, let me, let me show you that you know, real refrigerator magnets, uh, I told you last time that they often have more than a pair of poles. They have many poles. And one way you can de detect this, so, so when you go home and find your refrigerator magnets, put two of them together, and you'll, you'll, if you work at it, you can find the orientation where they stick. But if you start moving them across each other, they, they alternately stick and repel. Can you hear the buzzing as I'm doing that? That's because these guys have striped poles. They have a north pole, a gap. South pole, gap. North pole, south pole. And as I'm sliding them across each other like this, I found the right orientation. Whenever the north and south poles are across each other, they stick. Whenever they shifted one over and their south pole and south pole are across each other, they repel. So you get this alternating attraction repulsion. And you can see these, you can see the patterns. I'm, I'm not going to put iron powder on the actual magnet because ne I never get it off and then it's ugly forever. Okay. So you're now looking down on the magnet, on a sheet of paper on the magnet. I'm going to turn the lamp on again. And I w I'm going to sprinkle some powdered iron on here. Can you see the stripes? If I zoom in a little bit. Zoom, zoom, zoom. I don't want to. I don't want to um, disturb the. You, you can see it. The, the vertical stripes. One. Uh, the, the iron is attracted. It is magnetized by and is attracted to sit between a North Pole and a South Pole. It loves being between those two. It develops a South Pole near the North Pole and a North Pole near the South Pole and just sits there. It's happy as a clam. At the points right over the poles, it, it, it's, it doesn't know what to do. So it, it goes to the, to the gaps between poles. And there you see them. All right? Uh, pick this up, take my magnet out. What I want to show you then is pick the least important credit card. So here's a credit card signed by me. Ooh, so important. OK, I'll zoom in some more. And I'm going to sprinkle, I'll sprinkle the iron on, on there here. I usually get away with this without upsetting the credit card. OK, and now let's carry that across and drop off the excess. OK, is it there? Yes. And now if I'm lucky, I will be able to show you the pattern. Come on. Can you see the vertical stripes again? And what's different about the vertical stripes in this case is compared to the uh, refrigerator magnet. The refrigerator magnet is uniformly polar magnetized north, south, north, in these stripes, north, south, north, south, very evenly. This is, has some, some uh, pattern to it, uh, erratic pattern to it. There are, first off, there are, two, there are two sections. I don't know why they do this, but it's always the case. I've never seen otherwise. There are two rows of, of, of information on this card. 
There's a lower row and the upper row, and a gap in between them where there's not, no magnetization. So these stripes are not evenly spaced anymore. Again, the iron's sitting between north and south poles, but the gaps in the structure of that, of that spacing, that's the information. That is, you know, it's got, probably got my name on it, my credit card number, all the information that, that, that hackers would love to steal. It's all on there in the, in the structure of those magnetic poles. Again, it's a hard magnetic material that has been coated onto that surface, and it's, it's been magnetized in this patchy way to invest, invest it with, it, with with information. Any questions about, about this, these ideas? So, so this is the last of the magnetic tape structures that, I, that I sort of, we see on a daily basis. We still use a lot of magnetic storage, but it's, it's disk drives. And disk drives, again, have hard magnetic materials on them that are, that are magnetized in, in, a, in a patchy manner to, to, to put ones and zeros in them that, that are then uh, your, your photographs and your videos and your text documents and all that stuff. All right? Let me go back to normal and clean off my credit card. Well, I guess I can clean off later. Ah, is that what we wanted? No, that's not what I wanted. That's what I wanted. All right. So that's magnetic materials. Any, any, again, any questions? Magnetic materials. Okay, so if you buy a refrigerator that's, that, that has a non-magnetic metal, for example, stainless steel, there, there are no magnetic domains there. You go down to the atomic level, the mag magnetism's dead. Uh, or most stainless steel, well, cheap stainless steels are non-magnetic. Copper, aluminum, uh, non-magnetic. Plastics, non-magnetic, and so on. Uh, okay. This is, this is a, this is a, have you been uh, yeah, paying attention? When a bar magnet or button magnet for a refrigerator is first formed out of molten ingredients, what does it have? How many think it has no magnetic poles on its ends? How many think it has a north pole on, on both of its ends? South pole on both of its ends. A north pole on one end and a south pole on the other. We'll go back to A. How many think there are no magnetic poles on its ends? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's broken up into domains which cancel. It has no, there's no uh, reason why one end would be a pole and the other would not. It's, uh, it's, it's randomized. You have to magnetize it. So this credit card, when it was first made, no magnetization. what cuffs are for, cleaning thumbs. All right. Compass needle then. Why does a compass needle point north, magnetic compass needle? And the answer to that is that the Earth has associated with it some a magnetic character. It's got, a, it's got a north pole and a south pole. And the compass needle, you could think of it as trying to point its north pole towards the south pole of the Earth and the it, south pole towards the north pole is Earth. But another way to think about it is to, is to leave apart the idea of poles, just as we did with the idea of forces between poles. Remember, we, if you think back, there was a time when I talked about the forces between charges. And then I said, well, instead of saying positive charge A and positive charge B push directly on each other, let's let positive charge A create a structure around it called an electric field, which in turn pushes on positive charge B, and vice versa. That electric field is, seems like a nuisance, but actually it turns out to be real. Okay, and we looked at various ways in which to think about the electric field. Um, it, it shows up whenever there's a variation in voltage, what's called a voltage gradient. The electric field always points from high voltage to low voltage in the direction that, that positive charges love to go. So, there, so, there, so, so anyway, I, I, I pulled the electric field out of a hat and then, then gave it reason for existing. Well, we can do the same thing with magnetism. Instead of thinking about the, the force between the, the compass needle, compass needle's north pole, so, so we can look, and the Earth's magnetic poles, we can say that the Earth creates a structure around it that then influences the compass needle. 
and in principle, vice, or vice versa, but really they're so, they're so uh, different in size and stuff that, that the, the main issue is the Earth's magnetic field influences the compass needle. So the Earth does indeed create a magnetic field. And magnetic fields, what they do is they, is they push on magnetic poles. And so the, mag the, the magnetic field of the Earth is such that it pushes north magnetic poles towards the geographic north. So if I, if, I, if I imagine that I actually have a pure north pole, as, as, well, as I've told you, we've never observed one in nature, but suppose I had one anyway, hypothetically. If I had it here, and that's actually geographic north there, it would be pushed toward the north by the Earth's magnetic field. Okay. Um, in reality, a compass needle doesn't have a pure north pole. It's also got a south pole. Well, that's okay because the south pole of a compass needle is pushed towards, uh, pushed opposite the, the Earth's magnetic field. South poles go the wrong way, just like negative charges go the wrong way in an electric field. South poles go the wrong way in a, in a magnetic field, and the south pole of the compass needle is pushed southward by the Earth's magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field really does point approximately north, but I'll, I'll go into more detail about that in a second. So the consequence to a compass needle is, the compass needle has two poles on it, one of which is pushed northward, one of which is pushed southward. And it, that makes the compass needle orient. The compass needle, which might have been pointing this way, suddenly realizes, oh, my north pole, well, I'll, let, me, let me, big compass needle as you can see it. This is a big compass needle, okay? If it were like this, the North Pole is pushed in the direction of the magnetic field, which is that way, and the South Pole is pushed opposite the magnetic field, which is that way. Th this needle will go woof, and, and it'll, it'll accumulate a little bit of angular momentum, it'll overshoot, it'll go back and forth, doo 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 doo, until it settles. A little, it needs a little friction to, to settle down, and it'll orient like that. And if you've ever played with the compass, that's what it does. The needle goes woo, back and forth a little bit, and then it settles. Is that okay? It experiences a torque whenever it's oriented a little off uh, because of the, the two forces are acting on it twist it and, and, and line it up. So, that, so when you're out, if you, if you ever use a compass anymore, of course there's one in your phone, but, but a magnetic compass has you know, got it in your phone, but there's no needle, it's magnetic sensors. It's too bad. Anyhow, um, if, you're, if you're out there, you're a scout, and you're out there with your compass needle, you, you know, it's orienting itself because it's trying to line up with the magnetic field. It's always trying to bring its north pole as far uh, in the direction of the field as possible, and its south pole as far up opposite the magnetic field as possible, and it lines up. Hope, is, uh, you okay with that? Yeah. Do other planets have magnetic fields? Do other planets have magnetic fields? a good question. I'm not sure. I don't think that the moon has one. Um, in fact, the very, the, the, the that the Earth has one is itself kind of a remarkable thing, because it, you know, where does that magnetic field come from? And it turns out to be very important to us, because among other things, it, it, it protects us against cosmic rays and stuff, which is a whole level of detail. But yet, I don't know what, what, whether the, there's a lot of magnetism in the, in the sun, whether it has a net pole or not, I don't know. And these are all, you can look them up. I mean, I'll, 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 I'll go looking for it. What I wanted to say, you know, thinking about that, this question then is the Earth acts like a giant bar magnet. It develops a pole, a, a, mag, a magnetic field that, that pushes the north pole of your compass needle northward. And I can also say that north poles are repelled by north poles and attracted by south poles. And you, you've already seen that. So based on those, sort of those observations, what's at the Earth's north geographic pole? That is, up there, way up north of, of Alaska, of, of, you know, north of Alaska, north of Canada, there is a magnetic pole somewhere up there. Is it a north pole or a south pole? That is a, a magnetic, yeah, magnetic pole. You know, okay, the question, a question about the question? How many think that it's a south magnetic pole up there? How many think it's a north magnetic pole up there? Okay, the, you got it right. I mean, the vast majority of you are going for that it's a south magnetic pole. That is true. The Earth's south magnetic pole is located 
pretty near the North Pole, under, or under the North Pole. Um, odd, you know, it's odd, <laughs> odd fun facts. The, the magnetic poles are reversed. Um, but that said, the Earth's magnetic, the, the origin of the Earth's magnetic field, and it, the fact that it's got a net pole, it, it, it's got a net dipole with a south pole up north and a north pole down south. That's an area of, of current research to some extent. Um, it seems to have to do with the fluid flow of, of the metals in the core of the Earth. The, 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 earth, the earth is spinning, it's got fluids in there, they happen to be molten iron and stuff like that. That, that motion uh, seems to give rise to the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, it may be better understood than I know, but, but it's, it, last I knew it was something people were still studying like crazy. And that said, it changes periodically. F furthermore, it moves. The, the location of the Earth's south magnetic pole, which again, I told you is up north, it's, it's not at ground level. It's way below ground level, first off, which means that if your compass really had its druthers, it wouldn't point north horizontally. It would point north and downward because it's trying to line up with the magnetic field that's, that's, that's uh, associated with a pole that's underground on a round, on a spherical object, kind of complicated, nearly spherical object. But the other thing is the location of that south magnetic pole under the Arctic is moving. It moves, it's not super fast, it's, it's like miles per year. It's not trivial, but it's, it's, uh, it is moving. And first of all, it's location underground and not exactly perfectly associated, aligned with the Earth's North Pole and stuff means that if you, if you try to orient using a magnetic compass, you gotta correct for, there are a lot of corrections to, to put in. When it points north, that's not exactly north. It's a little mess, messed up, and it, for, for people who are navigating by compass for long distances, it can amount to some, some, some error. You won't be exactly where you think you are if you're following the, the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, the other thing about the Earth's magnetic or, uh, dipole is it reverses periodically, and I don't know when the last reversal was. I, I meant to look it up. They, they know this in part because when uh, in volcanic eruptions, some of the, some of the, uh, the cooling magma it becomes magnetic materials, and it cools from liquid state into a solid, it, it gets magnetized, and it remembers for millennia, for, for, for millions of years, it remembers the magnetization of the Earth when it, when it uh, solidified, and so they can go back and look and see what the Earth's magnetic field was like um, uh, 100,000 years ago, a million years ago, 10 million years ago, and it's been flipping every once in a while. And um, yeah, so there are, there are times when your compass would point the wrong way. I mean, these are ge on geological time scales. But, but in any case, the comp where, which way your compass is, needles mo is pointing moves with time and it flips occasionally. And there are issues like how do birds deal with this? Uh, when the, the, the Earth's magnetic field reverses, the birds suddenly are, are migrating the wrong direction. They got to deal with that. So, anyhow, I said my story. Okay, so magnetic fields. Uh, another way to look at the forces between magnets, but it, but finally it becomes important. Okay, so where I'm going to go with this then is, if we've got we got magnetic poles, we've got mag, uh, magnetic fields. Actually, I, I, one I, one more demonstration to show you running out of sh clean sheets of paper. I just want to show you, you can, you can actually see the magnetic field around a bar magnet to an extent. Hmm? Yeah, I'll switch the camera, thanks. Down to. So now you're looking down at a sheet of paper, and here are iron filings in a, a bubble. Zoom back out, and I think I'm gonna have to turn off the lamp. Um, So now, I wish I could get rid of the bubble, but I can't. There's a fluid in there full of iron filings, and I'm gonna put a little magnet in there, 
And the magnet will magnetize the iron filings, and they will line up such that they'll, they'll develop a north, each iron filing will develop a north pole and a south pole under the influence of the little bar magnet, and it will then magnetize the next iron filing, which will magnetize the next one. They'll, they'll form long chains, and the chains are floppy, but they will line up as best they can with the local magnetic field. And so this is going to map out the magnetic field, what are called flux lines, but they're, they're basically the magnetic field uh, is, a, is a vector field, it's, it's all these little arrows that get, they get weaker as you get farther from the magnetic poles. And they, it, it turns out they always go from north poles to south poles when you start with, with, with uh, when, you, when you're working with pole, with objects that have magnetic pole. So what I hope you can start to see is that it's forming this if this is a bar magnet. It's forming this structure that wraps around the bar magnet, comes, shoots out of, the, out of the North Pole, because the magnetic field points away from North Poles, and it points towards South Pole, so it arcs around. So there it is evolving and, and developing this, that, that structure. OK? It's up live, it's actually more visible than it is on the camera. The camera's sort of losing something in part because of the bubbles. <clears throat> OK, so where I wanted to, to, to finish here before I run out of time, I'll, I'll just let this guy go and not worry about it, <clears throat> is that there is a relationship between the electricity and magnetism. Um, you might have noticed this with me magnetizing the, the, the bar magnets backwards and forwards using something that was plugged in. So it's an electric device, but somehow it's having a magnetic influence. So that was a hint. Um, what other hints do you have? Oh, that I was picking up the flipping domains over here somehow electrically and playing them with an electric speaker system, amplifier and speakers. So it turns out that there really is a strong relationship between electricity and magnetism. And there, it, it's, a, it's heavily interwoven, the two of them. And this is sort of the first appearance of that interweaving, and that, that is this. Electric charges, when they're sitting still, are essentially purely electric. But if you let them move as currents, then they're also magnetic. Currents of electric charge are magnetic. Uh, how, how magnetic? They develop magnetic fields around them. So a current actually has a magnetic field. It's, it's the orientation of the magnetic field is weird, and we'll, we'll come back to it. But what that means is that if you run electricity through a wire, it creates magnetic fields. It can influence magnets, permanent magnets. It can push them around. Or it can develop, uh, change the domains in a piece of, a piece of uh, iron. So here's, the, here's an example. Let me plug this guy in. This, this is an extremely powerful electromagnet over here. Also, the wires are, are, have, potentially have pretty dangerous voltages, so you've got to be a little careful with this. You can play with it after class, but be aware, no touching the wires, and don't like, come over here like this with your hand on this piece of iron, because they, they, they grab each other ferociously. Right now, nothing. This is a piece of, of pretty much pure iron, and these pole pieces here are pretty much pure iron. But when we run current through the, these coils, that is magnetic. And it will magnetize this iron, which will in turn magnetize this iron, and they will attract ferociously, like this. And you, you, I'm not sure I can get this off. Um, it's, it, it's gripping incredibly strongly, right? heavily magnetized. Where did the magnetic influence come from? From electric currents. If I turn off the power, and the, the energy that went into magnetizing to pull a positive pole and negative, uh, sorry, north pole and south pole apart, that's a lot of energy. When I, when I break the connection, watch what happens right here. That was the energy coming out. And now it's easy. Nope, we're back to normal. So that's, that's one electromagnet. The other electromagnet to, to, to play games with is up here. Um, another coil of wire and a little 9-volt battery. And right now, 
the coil of wire is going around a piece of iron, which is totally demagnetized. Its, it, its domains are all random direction. But we'll get its attention by flipping the switch. Flip. And now, OK. And if we unflip it, turn off the magnetic influence, it's demagnetizing, demagnetizing, done. OK? So electromagnets are using the fact that current and wire, a current moving, is magnetic. They're using that for these strong electromagnets to magnetize a piece of iron, which in turn develops huge magnetic poles and a very strong magnetic field of its own and can do grip things like crazy. So you're welcome to, to hang from that if you like to. All right, otherwise we'll see you Friday if you're here or after spring break if you're not. <laughs>